So we have our lightning talks, which is our traditional closing plenary for each day at PyCon Australia. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to welcome a representative from the Australian Computer Society Tasmanian branch, who are uh, our platinum sponsors for this year. Um, once again, they've been a huge friend to grassroots computing in uh, computing organisations within Tasmania, and uh, we're very proud to have the ACS involved um, with PyCon Australia in Hobart for the second year running. Uh, so could you please welcome Robbie Batten, who is the branch chair for uh, ACS in Tasmania. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to be very, very brief, uh, which I'm sure you'll all thank me for, because you're here to listen to lightning talks and not to me drone on. Uh, the ACS is really excited to be involved with PyCon again this year. Uh, we were very keen to find out about it when Chris came knocking last year and chatted to us about it. And uh, we were really excited when we actually got to participate in that event and really impressed with how it was run. So when they came up that it was back here again this year, uh, it was a no-brainer for us. We wanted to be involved. Uh, from my perspective, uh, PyCon is everything that an ICT event should be. Uh, it is engaged and it has a great outreach program. Uh, it has great rules to make sure that everyone's treated fairly and equally and that everyone can be involved. And it has a great passionate community that really seems to be welcoming. So uh, for me, I really want to also put out a thanks to Chris and all the other organisers behind the scenes who are putting on a really good event once again and setting an extremely high bar for whoever's organising next year. So I'd like to actually ask for a round of applause for the organisers. Uh, the Australian Computer Society hasn't always been heavily involved in communities such as open source communities, uh, including PyCon. Uh, we have always had lots of members. We've got over 20,000 members Australia-wide. And we've always had lots of members involved in these communities, but the organisation itself uh, has at times been a little bit remiss in that fact, uh, something that we're trying to change. Uh, we've been around since 1966, which is a long time in ICT, and that brings challenges. It makes it very hard for us to stay dynamic and to keep up to date, and it can make it difficult for us to be involved in all the areas that are really driving ICT forward, and it's a challenge we're trying to tackle. Uh, that's where we hope that we can get support from communities such as uh, PyCon and the Python programming community to help us stay relevant and to help us keep delivering value to the ICT community. Uh, I won't try and pretend that we're expecting to get lots and lots of members out of this event. That's not why we're involved in these events. We're involved in events like PyCon because these events really help drive the community to keep ICT moving forward. And whatever benefits the ICT community benefits our members. So that's why we're here uh, and that's what we're all about. Uh, so what I would like to just highlight is some of the things that we do do. And if any of it interests you, the most important part about the ACS is that our members are the ones who actually drive things. So if you get involved, then you have a chance to actually have influence over what we do. Uh, but we do offer professional development and quite an extensive amount of professional development to our members. Uh, we offer internationally recognised certification. Uh, that are rec It's recognised in pretty much every developed nation in the planet. Uh, we are, operate advocacy at the state and federal level. And you may have noticed that the federal government's cloud strategy that they're finally getting around to doing is actually being led by the Australian Computer Society. So we're heavily involved in that type of environment if you're interested in making a difference there. Uh, we operate a number of specialised communities of interest. Uh, we do curriculum development and any of you have an ICT degree from Australia or are studying, that degree was certified by the Australian Computer Society because we work with every university in Australia to do that. Uh, and we do things like offer our members professional indemnity insurance which is included in your membership fees and so forth. Uh, so if any of that does interest you and you're not a member, I highly recommend either contacting the TAS branch if you're Tasmanian, if you're interstate, have a chat to those, uh, your local branch. I'm not going to promise that you're necessarily going to talk to them and find out that that's exactly what's going to add value to your life. If it's not, all I ask is that you let them know why. Because as a society, we need to stay relevant and we're really keen to hear from people, especially the people who don't think that we are relevant. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I hope you all have a great conference. 
I hope that these lightning talks are inspiring for you. I've been looking forward to it because I missed out last year on the lightning talks. And I'll hand back over to Chris. So, lightning talks. You're probably familiar with how these run, or some of you may be, some of you may not be. I'll run through them. Talks go for five minutes. You can sign up on, you've signed up on the whiteboards outside. There'll be another session of these tomorrow where you can sign up for those probably from tomorrow morning onwards. You have five minutes to present on any topic that you like. We strictly enforce this time limit. Um, today our stopwatch has actually been provided by Moore's Cloud and you can see it on the table in front of me. I'm just going to start a countdown now on it and you'll see it starts at green and from two minutes onwards it fades down to yellow and from 30 seconds onwards it will start blinking. So hopefully that will be a nice easy way for you to spot when you're running out of time for the speakers. Um, so we have 11 lightning talks today who have signed up. Our first will be from Simon Mears and that will be followed by Frank Sainsbury. So Frank if you could come up and set up here our AV people will come and make sure that things are going for you. Um, so Uh, over here, Frank, this side. So, Simon, your time starts now. Okay, I'm on. You hear me? Okay. Um, so, this isn't necessarily a plug for anything, it's just me trying to be helpful. You can take it or leave it. We are, I assume, for the most part, programmers who have relatively sedentary jobs unless your desk looks like this, or like this. And I've been working on a formula for calculating weight loss and just uh, general fitness. You can digest that for a little bit. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, but the trickiest part about the formula is the two input parameters up the top. And I think, at least for me, and most of us probably have no idea what those two parameters are, the calculation itself is quite simple. There is also, of course, balancing out uh, the types of foods that you eat as well and knowing how much you should put in and how much your body is actually burning each day as well and until recently I had absolutely no idea. There is a website called eatthismuch.com which is a helpful little tool. You can plug in a few stats there and it will tell you how many calories you should be consuming in a day which so that gives you one of the parameters and the other parameter you can calculate by um, putting foods in, you can add custom foods and I can see that that BLT would cost me 307 calories out of the 2,000 or whatever I'm supposed to eat in a day. You can't manage what you don't, don't actually measure. So measurement, how many people have heard of photocracy? Well, probably 30%. It is largely inspired for gamers who are addicted to things and we've seen a lot of people turn their addiction to gaming into an addiction for fitness. I actually found it thanks to Randall Munro. Uh, a few of you may have seen that before. It's also been on Penny Arcade. The idea is that you uh, log exercise so it helps you to keep a record, that's the measuring part and gives you points for it. Of course you can game the system completely, that's not the point. You're supposed to be um, keeping yourself accountable and encouraging others to do so as well. There are groups, so it's a bit of a social network with a fitness bias. You can have challenges within your groups. There are quests if you're a gamer or just want to learn to do something new. There are achievements and it tracks your progress. It integrates with RunKeeper. This is a run that a group of us did this morning around Hobart. It manages your records, you can keep track of all your stats up the top and everything. Uh, you can watch yourself make progress. This is real stats which are very cool. You can watch your weight go down. That was me over the first three months having joined. It is Django powered, which I can prove. <laughs> So just a tool, doesn't work for everyone, try it out, see if it works for you, but I encourage you to use something even if not that. Is that you done? That's it. Well, thanks Simon. Okay, so our next speaker is Frank Sainsbury, followed by Tim Ansell. Tim, if you could go up to the other podium, 
And Frank, your time starts now. Rawr! I'm a Tasmanian. I've been put up to this by Paris. Paris Butford, the gentleman in the front row with the camera taking pictures. He has given me a set of slides. Interestingly enough, he hasn't let me actually look at them. So let's find out. On a journey together, what do we do? I need your help. That's obvious, eh? as long as one of you is a psychoanalyst. Hands up! <laughs> He's not there. Ah! My face. Who, who are the pictures? I've no idea who that is. Someone tell me, is that Rick Roll, the Rick Roll from Rick Roll? It's Chris. Is that you, Chris? God, blimey. Okay, so the goal, colonisation of Mars. I have been working on this project, and I've been spraying it up in the shed, and it's nearly ready. But I don't think it'll make Mars. It has a fundamental flaw, which is it's got propellers. Oh, come on, too many flipping. Hey, what have you got here? Which one have we got? Come on, give me that. It's, bro it's a big button. Take the glasses off. Jump to the next slide, it said. Jump to the slide. Yeah, the slide. Someone showed Frank how to advance his slides. Yeah, quick. Okay, I'll do that one. Ha ha, the goal colonisation of Mars, version one prototype. Ah, they've seen, and I've explained it didn't work. Version two. <laughs> <laughs> we attached me to Mars, is it? <laughs> By some means. How? Gin and Picon. <laughs> no, whiskey. Whiskey! Who's got my whiskey? Give it back. I'm, and money. I'm very good at providing money to out of work IT people, or unemployable, or self employed, or whatever they call themselves this way. They're, they're very, very good at providing an opportunity to get rid of loose cash. So, there are a number of people in the community who need loose cash. You know who they are. Give them money. See, I do. <laughs> I'm worth it. <laughs> why am I worth it? I'm not at all sure why I'm worth it. Um, on, the, on the plus side, what I should do is spend a few seconds trying to persuade you that sometimes I'm not crazy and I have, a, have something of a heart. I'm involved in Compassion, Compassion Australia. I'm a compassion advocate. Too small to ignore. I went to see this guy. Where's Stafford? International Compassion spoke. He was talking at Hillsongs in Sydney about six or seven years ago. And he, I came to his talk. He made me cry five times. I thought, oh, that's pretty rough. OK. I can go to his talk now. I've got it out of my system. Went to his next talk. He made me cry five times more. You should read this. This talks about what we do to the smallest and the least in our societies. Across the world, they are the people who die. Under fives die in sub-Saharan Africa at a rate that would make your eyes bust out of your head. Get a heart. Think about it. I don't care which one of the very many sponsorship things you do. Compassion is a very Christian organisation. They out and out sponsors through churches. They give people Bibles. You expect to write to them. You expect to pray to them, pray for them. Okay, you, that's one way of doing it. I don't care if you think that's a whole pie in the sky and don't want to do it, but you've got to get your money out of your pocket and give it to people who need it, people who for whom... That $2 a day turns into doubling of their income. Who takes a whole village and changes its lifestyle. One of the stories he told me that made me cry was he went to an African village, he lived there for a long time. When he was six, three quarters of the boys in the village who were six died from malaria. He didn't even get sick. He asked his father why, and because, of course, being a white boy, He'd been inoculated with something that made him immune to catching malaria in that particular strain. That and some other things which were revealed in this lovely book, Too Small to Ignore, is one of the things that fired him up to the age, I don't know how old he is now, 70 probably, still working as a CEO of a major, major organisation, driven to change the world. I'd like to think that we all want to change the world, I certainly do. I would like you to get your hands in your pockets and take out the money and sponsor through some organisation. As I said, I don't care which one. Find it in your hearts to spend that little bit extra and then when we come round to the next century, which I won't see but my Science. son might, 
then three, two, one, I'm released. Thank you. So what you're saying, Frank, Frank, it's not that it's not that they're worth uh, that you're worth it. It's that they're worth it. <laughs> yes. Thank so you, um, thanks, Frank. Up next we have Tim, followed by Dylan Jay. And Tim, your time starts now. Can people hear me now? Um, so I was originally going to do 10 projects in five minutes, but I decided that was crazy. So it's five projects in five minutes, which is probably still very crazy. Um, first project I'm talking about is Python DateTime TZ. Um, if you're using date and times, you should be using UTC. Um, if you're using date and times in Python, you should be using DateTime TZ. It's a drop-in replacement for DateTime that actually does time zones. Um, it cares deeply about time zones. It figures out your local time zone in like a bazillion different ways, and it like works. Um, I'm kind of a bit biased because I wrote it, but um, <laughs> it's definitely worth using. Um, it has a bunch of other things like it supports um, passing through the date util library. It uses PYTZ. I didn't re-implement that. And it supports going to and from Unix timestamps, unlike the original date time library, which seems to hate Unix timestamps for some reason. Um, that's where you get it. It's on the thing. Please help me make it everybody use it, um, because date times are hard and time zones are harder. So please use that. Um, I recommend that you also take a look at IPython Notebook, um, great tool for writing Python quickly, especially if you're a noob, um, which I am most of the time. Um, it looks kind of like this. You get lots of graphical, cool stuff. Pretty awesome. Um, if you're more of a command line junkie, um, I recommend bpython. It's basically a graphical command line console. It takes IPython and like, adds steroids. Um, so you get like online help and tab completion and all those type of things. Um, so now I'm going to ask you to help me. Um, I have a bunch of unfinished ideas. I'll be at the sprints. I would like your help to make them finished ideas. Um, first one's called Tim Videos. Um, it's a platform for videoing conferences like this um, and streaming them onto the web. Um, as you can see, it's made up of a bunch of different projects. Um, I'd like your help with all of them. Um, the GST switch and the streaming system are both Python-based. The website's Python and Django-based. Um, so um, I need your help. That's where you can find the code. Um, I'm not a Django programmer. I have like barely used it. So I would really like your help making it awesome rather than looking like it was coded by a five-year-old. Um, the other thing I'd like your help with is a thing called Tim's Finance. You might notice a naming scheme here. Um, so, so original, Tim. Um, last, uh, last year, um, I forget your name, sorry, um, came up and gave a presentation about Selenium scraping his bank details. Um, before that, I already had the same idea. Um, turns out fools think alike. Um, it's Django-based. Um, it turns out banks are stupid and don't give you like unique IDs for transactions. They give you a file which has some type of description and maybe a date if you're lucky. Um, those things all change, so I wrote a base class which deals with all those stupid things. All you have to do is write a little Selenium program to give it CSVs, and then it imports into the database. I don't have a front end. It's all Django-based. I need help with front end stuff. It does things like regex-based um, categorization. It does things that banks hate, like doing fee matching, so you can figure out where your fees are going. It supports transfers, because I'm not an accountant and think if I move money around, it doesn't make any difference. Um, it supports multiple currencies, country extraction. It tries to do anything, everything. Um, I would really like help. I haven't had time to work on it. Um, that's where you get the code form. Um, I seem to have managed to get through the five projects. So here's a bonus project. Um, Zookeeper is what runs the conference um, website. Um, it also runs Linux Conf.au website. Um, it's an open source project. I highly recommend you help out. Um, I'd really love to see the mobile UI that's been floating around merged into Zookeeper and a whole bunch of other things. Um, it's I don't actually know what this uses, um, but I highly recommend you hack on it at the sprints. And I'm over.
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay, so up next we have Dylan Jay, followed by Nick Farrell. Nick, if you could go to the other podium and make sure things are set up. Um, Dylan, your time starts now. Um, so just before I start, I've been asked by my friends at, uh, uh, in Japan to uh, give a plug for PyCon uh, APAC. So uh, how many people have been to Japan before? If you haven't been to Japan, it, I've been a lot around Asia. It is one of the most uh, awesomely different, weird, amazing places. So if you want a Python holiday uh, with a difference, APAC, uh, it's uh, the close of... Uh, the close uh, for for the closing date was 9th of July, so you got to get it uh, in quick for your um, uh, to give a presentation. So what I want to talk about uh, was uh, robot framework. Uh, how many people heard of robot framework? Not very many. Good, excellent. So uh, we were asked recently um, by the New South Wales government to develop a application in order to register all pools in New South Wales. So how many people are own a pool in New South Wales? You should have used this application to register your pool. Excellent. Um, so we had this problem. We had to fix it. Um, we had to test, sorry, the, the application we were building to make sure that it worked. Uh, and we wanted, it was going to involve JavaScript. We use uh, lands property information um, widget in order to work out addresses and stuff. Um, so it had to work with JavaScript. So we needed a different um, testing framework than we normally do. Um, so once this kind of loads up, you'll see it actually run through. Um, now there's a lot of testing frameworks. There's, uh, we were using test browser before, but there's web test, there's, uh, uh, um, there you go. That's running, blah, blah, blah. Functional web testing is not fast. But anyway, I'm just going to leave that running. This is interactively looking up, you know, the addresses and so on. Um, so, so why do we need another test framework? Um, you've got lots of them already. Um, you've got all these uh, behavior-driven development stuff. Um, that's going to get annoying. Uh, you've got um, several f um, functional test-driven ones. So do we need another one? Um, the fit one, uh, there was a talk earlier. earlier. This is quite similar, but um, I think better. Um, Actually, it has a history. It's not new. Um, it was uh, developed by it was developed by Nokia. It was first released and open sourced actually in 2008, um, and it and it has this keyword-driven development approach. Um, so it looks a little bit like this. So you have a text file. Uh, yeah, there is a headless version. There's two ways to run it, by the way. There's a uh, there's the natural uh, the inbuilt robot framework runner, so you don't. Um, but I'm using something called Robot Suite, which integrates it into um, your normal unit testing framework, so you can use layers and everything like that. Um, it's a little bit new, uh, and it doesn't really like Control C that much because it runs subprocessors. Um, so. So it's a functional web. Uh, it uses Selenium underneath. Uh, so you get all the Selenium keywords, all the power of Selenium, um, without having to touch Java. Um, so it tests JavaScript, which is what we wanted. But it's also written in Python. Uh, the Plone community just switch, uh, recently switched all their um, functional web testing to using Robot Framework. So I thought, good idea to have a look. But it's actually a generic testing framework, or generic functional testing framework. Um, it has this concept of libraries, so you can hook in all sorts of different libraries to test, you know, things like, you know, desktop apps, and uh, uh, you can. We use the XML RPC library to do certain to to um, get certain information about mail objects and stuff. Um, there's a Telnet library, there's process library, there's XMLs, etc. So it has this idea of a text file, and you can see the test case is is kind of designed to be reasonably uh, easy to read. Um, you have a bunch of these different test cases. Um, so keywords, the real idea of keywords is to try and hide the details. You want to kind of modularize your tests. Um, my aim personally is to try and have tests I can give to clients. 
Um, they, they take arguments. There's these uh, different ways of. Uh, it supports the Gherkin syntax. Um, and Robot Suite works with layers and. That's uh, more Two, information on a robot text. One. Thank you very much, Dylan. <laughs> okay, so um, Nick Farrell's machine was kind of sort of not working. So our next speaker, Mike Dewhurst, if you could set up. Do you have some slides or something like that, Mike? Uh, so we'll just give you a moment to set up on that podium over there. Ryan will help you. And um, just twiddle your thumbs for a few minutes while the AV gets set up. And over on the right-hand side, could we have Josh Dupre? <laughs> oh, really? Yes, that one. So it looks like Josh Dupre is ready to go. So you just let me get the machine Am ready. I? You are on. So Josh, your time starts now. Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> Stop it, he only has five minutes. I, I didn't expect such a response straight off the bat. Okay, so um, I'm the other Josh, and uh, I'm, this is a lightning talk about Code Wars, which hopefully most of you went to last night. Uh, it was the second Code Wars I was responsible for arranging, and so I thought I'd better get up and talk about it. So a long, long time ago, uh, that man over there, Chris, um, basically we had a chat and he asked if I could organize the Code Wars. Um, I don't really understand why he did this, um, especially um, considering how deranged I am, but YOLO. So um, tip number zero I have is if you want to start a war, start by getting shanghai by Chris. Okay. So at that point, I was clear to start Code Wars. And um, obviously, when you're embarking on a new endeavor, it's very important to do basic research, um, especially in things like Code Wars. Anyone who's done higher research, like a master's or PhD, will agree that the most important part of research is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is full of fun facts, such as um, the existence of the Cod Wars. <laughs> so this, this was an actual, dis <laughs> an actual um, fishing territory dispute between the Iceland and the UK. Um, and this demonstrates the first thing that I um, developed about Code Wars, and that is always offend the enemy with lame jokes and bad puns the whole way, as often as possible. The enemy is the audience. So a Code Wars is a competition for coders, and um, it's fought and won with code. That means the puzzles have to be interesting and um, challenging to programmers. So first of all, what appeals to programmers, uh, such as these types? Um, nostalgia. OK, so apply nostalgia to maximum effect. Programmers and software engineers love ancient code and legacy systems. And wading through poor documentation and anti-patterns are what they do all day. So, and if they do it all day, they must enjoy it a lot. So, so do it. <laughs> the second thing is um, programmers also love mystery. To adequately fill up the 20 minutes per problem, you have to give them as many possible directions to investigate and no hard clues about where to go to solve the problem. This is also a direct parallel to their day jobs, which they must certainly enjoy. Many modern developers love stylish, abrupt font changes, colorful background imagery and text, and animations such as you can obtain with a marquee tag or GIFs. So cheap effects give you a lot of bang for your buck. And finally, developers love working with text. 
provide lots of text. It doesn't matter what the text is. Something totally irrelevant and even utterly offensive to logic and reason is perfectly acceptable. So that's what appeals to programmers. Now I shall describe how to build problems that challenge them. Each puzzle should take roughly 20 minutes to solve. Developers that come to PyCon tend to be fairly talented, so you trip them up with basic techniques such as the Spanish Inquisition method. You pick a method that nobody expects because it's too obvious. Encode the secret in the most basic way you can imagine. A cheap variation on this is to choose a container file format that is interesting from a Python uh, perspective, such as one that has poor library support, and then you halfway into the competition, reveal a software product that does it better. The competitors will love you for doing this. <laughs> or better yet, take a library they should be familiar with, like NumPy or SciPy, and then hide the data using a one-liner. But don't forget to check that you can decode it later on. One last thing, though. Programmers simply love questioning their own opinions and their values. So what you should do is, using a current event as inspiration, make them spend effort on the side they are likely to ethically disagree with, such as building deliberate security vulnerabilities or privacy violations into an app. And uh, with that, um, my talk is over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, and to everyone else, I am so, so sorry. Um, so, Mike Dewhurst, do I see somebody's uh, machine working over there? Ryan? Is that, uh, are, we getting, are we getting a new machine working? Okay, so Mike Dewhurst is up next, and uh, followed by Peter Lovett on this machine over here. So, uh, Mike, your time starts now. Are there any venture capitalists in the room? <laughs> any MBAs? Okay. All projects require investment, whether it's a small project and uh, just a little bit of time and effort or a large project that requires a serious investment. So who invests without a business plan? On account of the uh, no venture capitalists in the room, I'm quite comfortable saying this. I, I needed to start a project um, a couple of years ago and I went around to the venture capitalists and that's exactly what they said. <laughs> which, is a bit, uh, which was a bit um, sad for me, but I decided I'd go away and and put together, a, turn the prototype into a product and find some customers and generate a revenue flow. In order to do that, I needed revenue, but I didn't have any. So what I did was write a framework for recruiting resources and putting a, a team together. And I put it up on, um, GitHub, it's a sweat equity framework, which I enjoyed doing. And I, I, I don't know whether this is going to work. If we've, you might have to switch off your, your, um, Wi-Fi devices. Are we getting there? Aha! The equity agreement is the, uh, the key to all this. It's, it's probably not worth looking at here. If you're interested, um, that's the address. But essentially what it says is that you have to have an equity plan and you have to be able to convert time and effort into equity. And the key to it is eventually you're going to get a venture capitalist involved. And at that point, the sweat that's been turned into equity can either be left there or converted into cash at the same rate that the, the venture capitalist invests in. And if you keep it in there, the equity agreement says you can continue to hold it and every month you get an opportunity to trade it in-house. 
and the price of that equity to be traded in-house will be at the most recent external investment or whatever anybody cares to pay for it if it's above that. So that's essentially it. The other guidelines um, I'll leave to your um, uh, perusal and uh, they suit me, possibly they'll suit you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So up next we have Peter Lovett, and he will be followed by Samantha Connolly. So Samantha, if you could go over to that lectern there, that would be fantastic. And Peter, your time starts, hang on. I'm going to leave you hanging here. Oh, he's, he's doing an interesting dance. I'm not Suspense going to start the time, very it's fantastic. <laughs> Suspense is very... Now. Pursuing the seification of Python. It is a well-known and oft-demonstrated fact that a person whose work is incomprehensible is held in high esteem, as it says in the Intercal reference manual. What I'm going to be doing is showing you what to do by showing you what not to do. Now, Guido tries to stop us. I've found a way around it. If you do from future import braces, you get syntax error. Not a chance. But that's not quite true. You can use braces on ifs. If i is greater than three, print hello world, semicolon, sort of, print goodbye. <laughs> you can use it on loops. While true, print hello world, semicolon, sort of, goodbye. <laughs> you can indent however the heck you like. This is all valid Python, works a treat. You can put the braces wherever you like. <laughs> if it's indented by one space. A couple of small problems I've come across, like the order is wrong, <laughs> and you have to do an even number of steps. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You can use semicolons. They've worked in Python since, like, ever. If you're going to make it look like C, you might as well wrap your tests in parens. You can even use pre-increment. Unfortunately, I hit a couple of snags on that one. Doesn't work quite as well as I'd like. And uh, postfix is broken. Oh, now this one's nice. You can even use C++ style comments. <laughs> Bonus point if you can tell me what J is. It's not two. Even though it says two is the answer. Even better. Go to's. Go to's not always considered harmful. Found a lovely little module called GoTo. <laughs> this is true, valid Python. So you can do loops without doing loops. Oops. With the GoTo. A uh, couple of apologies. Apologies to PEP8, apologies to PEP7, apologies to PSF, apologies to GVR, and apologies to any sane programmer ever. <laughs> And with a disclaimer, this was a joke. <laughs> this is not intended. I don't want to see this sort of code out there. And in especially uh, in memory for, of Dennis Ritchie, who died something like a week after Stephen Jobs, and yet in my and any technical person's opinion, was far more um, important to the level of, uh, of technology that we actually have today, the creator of the C programming language. I've still got some time, so bonus point. What's the bonus prize? What's the value of J? Who said false? Very good. I've still got some more time. Um, bonus prize. Anyone tell me about Intercal and what it was famous for? Come from. <laughs> that wasn't what I heard it over here. Come from. Thank you very much. Intercal was a joke language that. Um, instead of having a go-to, has a come from. <laughs> and that endeth the lesson. Thank you very much. So I was going to have you ejected from the conference for uh, causing severe of offence to everybody in this room, Peter, but thank you for the bribe. Uh, so up next we have Samantha Connolly, yeah. followed by Nathan Fagin. Um, so, Samantha, your time starts now. So, how do we promote IT? Is Python the answer? I can't give you that answer, but I can at least give you some ideas. So, 
there is a, an issue. Apparently, even though we've had amazing turnout today, we've had record-breaking numbers uh, uh, come to this conference this weekend, um, there's still less and less people studying IT past grade 10 or wanting to study technology or anything like that. There is a survey. The ACS have done it. Um, it says so. Um, but there are, everyone uses technology. All these young people have phones every, or they have the internet at home, or they're, they're always on social media, or they're always doing something with technology, but they don't necessarily want to learn or want to get into it. How can we address this issue? So, in my opinion, and I'll just state that again, it's my personal opinion, don't take it as fact or whatnot. Um, teachers may be misinformed about careers in technology, they may not know how to promote it. This is another good thing with the ACS as well. As well. I, I, I know personally the TASBEC is actually trying, looking into engaging high school teachers in this area in how to promote technology. Um, so maybe that's a step in the right direction. But there's also misconceptions about IT profession. It seems as a bit mundane, maybe it's boring. Um, how can we overcome those misconceptions out there? There are, for example, TV series which promote geekdom as quite introverted, uh, nerdy people. I don't need to say what type of TV series. but. Um, and also, someone was telling me that they, a student came up with this quote, but oh, I don't want to sit in front of a computer all day. And I will ask them this question, what type of person doesn't sit in front of their computer later on in their career? So uh, I think we all diverge towards sitting in front of computers eventually. So technology is fun. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't or engaging. And Python's meant to be fun, right? That's what everyone says. So you may be familiar with this comic. Uh, apparently you can fly with Python. I guess you can do whatever you like with Python. Um, so in my experiences, in I, I, I have promoted um, engineering and technology through RoboGirls by running robotics workshops with young people. Um, and they, they really engaged with that. Robots are cool and sexy, and I think they're a fun way of promoting engineering and technology to young kids. Uh, and I also have my own radio show called Robo Radio, so if there are any locals who would like to come on and talk about technology, feel free to contact me. I, I'm always looking for more people to come on. Um, but that's also helped me be able to talk to people. Uh, and I think that's what we, we need to do as an industry, is just talk to people about our ideas and our technology and what we can do. So because I've run robotics workshops, I'd actually like to see if I can run Raspberry Pi workshops with Python, see if I can engage children um, or young people with Python as a language. How can I teach um, other people who are non-programmers about Python? It's meant to be fun, right? So anyone can do it. Um, so I'd also, I know there's a Java operating system for Lego Mindstorm as well. Um, and I like to say that that's quite fun. Um, is there a version of, I know there is an old version of Python for Lego Mindstorms, um, but I'd like to see maybe an updated version which has just as much support as uh, Legos, which is the Lego Java operating system. Um, I'd also like to explore Arduino Robotics and Python. Maybe there are some interconnections there that I'm unaware of, uh, how I can promote this more. So, also maybe some other side notes. I could potentially run building a basic app for Android with, with young people uh, that might engage them somewhat. Um, and also graphical programming is quite fun. I enjoy promoting engineering and technology to kids using the Lego Mindstorm software. It's all graphical and I've got these, uh, I'm tutoring these year four, year four kids and they're adamant, they know how to program because they can use this NXT software. I mean like sure it might be uh, a misconception, oops wrong arrow, and I have a conclusion. Um, I don't have answers but we need to have these conversations with people in our community to get the word out there about technology. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so up next we have Nathan, and then I think we have one more after that. Excellent. Okay, so Nathan, your time starts now. 
All right. Um, there's been a lot of talk about IPython notebooks, uh, so I thought I'd share a link to the IPython NB viewer, um, which I'm not affiliated in any way with, I just think is really awesome. Uh, basically, it's like an online tool that people use to share their notebooks. Um, so if you have a GitHub account and you've committed your notebooks to your public GitHub account, you can share them with NB viewer. That's basically it. That's all I wanted to say. So now I'm going to show you some examples. Um, essentially, the way it works is you cut and paste uh, the URL of your, your notebook file, which can either be a gist or a, um, a public uh, git link, a raw link. And people have been doing that to share all sorts of interesting things, such as you know how to draw XKCD plots. Um, there's a gallery of interesting notebooks um, where people have been communicating basically um, what they've been doing in areas such as scientific computing, social science. There's a whole lot of tutorials. There's some interesting stuff about social data. I think there was a talk earlier today about that stuff. Um, you know, people are doing great stuff. It's pretty neat. Uh, the advantage of stuff like NB Viewer is that you can download notebooks. So once you download a notebook, you can load it into your public, uh, I mean your local uh, notebook viewer and then run them and you own the code. So it's a really good way of sharing things. Uh, okay. What have we got here? People plots. People plots are cool. People are doing people plots. Uh, XKCD plots. So the, the idea is that this is just a really open way of communicating your, your ideas. Um, the guts of it is, if you have a GitHub account, which I have, um, and you've put your IPython notebook file, which is sort of like a JSON file up there, you can get to the raw URL link. Once you get to the raw URL link, you basically cut and paste that URL into the IPython notebook viewer and you click go. It's probably not going to work, but it will. And it does. So you can basically generate um, these these links that then you can send to people. They can introspect your, your notebook files. So this is all being dynamically rendered. And that's it. That's my lightning talk, guys. Use, use notebook VR. Thank you very much, Nathan. And I understand that um, Mick Farrell has fixed his laptop and is now ready to go. Yeah. Uh, so your time starts now. Hello, everyone. I was briefly talking at lunch to a couple of people, and I believe it is. I switched it on. It's on. It's on. I'm talking. Hello. I was talking to a couple of people at lunchtime, and I realized that some people here don't understand super and MRO and a couple of things like that. So while some of you, this will all be old hat, uh, others uh, may benefit. So I'm just I've brought up a little VI session here with a couple of sample scripts I threw together just to give you a quick introduction into what super is, what MRO is, and a little bit on mix-ins. Uh, so basically, as you can see, I, there's a, ba a class here doing something basic. Um, the, the simplest pattern using super is you subclass this class. This is Python 3, so you don't need object here. Um, within the class, you can use super to invoke the original method or any other method on your parent class and do whatever you want, manipulate the result. OK. On the right, I've just pre-baked what the output is, so you can see what it's doing without running anything. That's the basics. That's all super does. Now, as you can see, I've invoked MRO on the classes. This, well, this attribute provides a list, an ordered well, tuple of the classes which will be inspected to find an attribute when you try to get it, particularly for calling a method. So in this case, you can see the do stuff will first uh, look in the do stuff method declared in main, otherwise it will fall back on the generic object. And simply when I subclass, it just means it looks in the other place first. That's pretty basic. Now, uh, first of all, I'm showing you the next iteration. Here, I've created a logging mix-in. So this is still specific to foo, but the intention is that somehow or other, you want to combine the two. You want to have this derived class 
do your foo behavior, but you want to use this nice mix-in, which is at the moment uh, not very agnostic, to do some print statements around it. So quick poll, which one's right? If I want it to first look, uh, first try the logging mix-in, and then its super should be the do stuff, which one goes first? Is do stuff two correct or is do stuff one correct? Hands up if you think do stuff one is correct. Hands up if you think do stuff two is correct. Well, one is correct. So you were, more of you were right than wrong, but most of you didn't know. <laughs> so, okay, so the right, the right thing, like I say there, is one, so it just means you read what I said. Uh, okay, jumping along, I'll move across, so that was the output of the previous. This is the enhanced version. This is, uh, it could be done better, but this is showing how you could make a mix in which is more agnostic. In this case, I don't care what method you call on the base class, I'm going to intercept it using get attribute. I can print some info about it, then I'll call the real method, pass back the result. In this case, I'll also log the result before I come back to the parent. If I, I could use func tools, wraps, etc., to make this look a bit nicer, but that's not what this is about. This is just an example of how you can harness the advantage of making a mix-in, drop it in, just a brief taster as to the introduction to it. That's all there is. Hopefully some of you have benefited from this. Thank you. And that is the last of our lightning talks for this evening. Uh, so, uh, firstly, thank all of our Lightning Talk presenters. I think they've all been pretty damn good. Okay. So